Just talk on your end for a second. I'm testing the mic level. Test, test. One, two, three. Hoo ya. Feeling good, looking good. It's Audible. coming in. Hollywood. I'm keeping that in there. <laughs> what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. I'm especially excited. Today, we have Commander Mark Devine, who's an expert in human performance, mental toughness, and leadership. Commander Devine's journey has been truly remarkable. He went from MBA to CPA at Pricewaterhouse to elite Navy SEAL officer, to founding successful Coronado Brewing Company, to founder of NavySeals.com, to founder and CEO of SealFit. He's a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling author of Unbeatable Mind, Forge Resiliency, and Mental Toughness to Succeed at an Elite Level. Commander Mark, thanks for joining me. Hey, thank you very, very much, Jeremy. It's great to be here. And shout out, everyone should check out Unbeatable Mind. I listened to it one and a half times so far. It is fantastic. Some great stories, great lessons. And I always like to start off with a fun fact. And fun fact (laughs) about you is you have two nicknames. One from Fraternity Gigs is Jigs. 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 (laughs) And nickname from the SEALs, Cyborg. Right. So how did you get those? Um. Well, both were given to me. They were not personally selected, of course, which is okay. obviously the normal case with nicknames. Uh, Jigs is kind of embarrassing, so I'm not sure I want to tell you guys what that one was. Uh, but it has something to do with the a reference to the movie American Gigolo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> For your wife's sake, maybe we should not talk about right, we're that. Let's not delve into that one. And then, uh, yeah, that was college a long time ago. And then in the nicknames, um, the cyborg came up because um, you know I was um, I was you know physically. Uh, very physically fit, even by SEAL standards, and I, and um, on long endurance type evolutions, you know, I just I just wouldn't slow down. Yeah. There was no quit. There was just no stop. You know, in, in me, and I think that was largely because I grew up running running up and down the mountains of the Adirondacks and swimming long long distances, and so just really kind of forged that that kind of uh, cyborgian <laughs> nature. <laughs> so, so, Mark, when was the time that you were your um, seal, uh, your seal, the other seal saw that there was no stop in you. Well, they saw it, you know, this is really when I got into my first platoon, you know, because B- Bud's training was, everyone was kind of paying attention to their own selves. Right. It wasn't really much of a team around that until, you know, we got into the seal teams. And then, of course, the seal teams, my first platoon uh, was kind of fun because I, I was a third officer, meaning, you know, most platoons have two officers, you know, the, the OIC and the assistant OIC, and, and here I was a third wheel, which is a great experience for me because I got to basically be like an enlisted guy. You know, I didn't have a ton of responsibility, um, you know, enough, obviously, and I had authority, but, you know, my job basically was to operate just like an enlisted guy would operate. And so, um, you know, they I think the team quickly saw that um, not only was I willing to just um, lead from the front and, and do everything that I was asked to do above standard. But, you know, I was, I was leading the charge on all the hardcore physical trainings that we did. And, and that was kind of fun for the team because you usually don't see that from the officers. <laughs> yeah. So what was the hardest core physical training that you went through in those days? Gosh, you know, um, it's, it's really hard to say, uh, Jeremy, because SEAL training, SEAL training for war is extraordinarily arduous. Yeah. Um, you know, a good example uh, is when we do our combat dive training. In combat dive training, you know, we're doing two four to six hour dives every day, uh, and we're trying to get a workout in. Right? These six hour dives are very rigorous. You know, um, oftentimes, you know, we'll put in um, in a zodiac, and we'll um, you know put in like a couple miles away from the target, and then we got to literally turtle back with all this gear and your right. dive rig on. You know, for a mile, a couple miles over the open ocean, and then oftentimes you're crawling over the beach, and especially the San Diego Bay, we crawl over the the uh, strand and then back into the bay, and 
turtle back and then you go on dive status and now you're underwater for three to four hours, you know, kick stroking uh, to your target, you know, wow. getting the mission accomplished and then you have to extract. And so to doing, doing that twice a day was extremely challenging. Right. Um, and we would do this for two weeks straight Jeez. Right, without, without stop. And that, that was just one example. You know, we go out and do um, small unit tactics training at Nyland, which is, you know, in the heat of the desert, completely barren out there. It's, you know, it's kind of like, looks like in the middle of Iraq. And, uh, you, know, we would, um, you know, we would train from, it was super hot, so we train early in the morning, you know, 5 a.m. until about noon, come in for lunch, take a break to get out of the heat, and then we go and out again at like 3 or 4 and train until 1 or 2 in the morning. Or yeah, the mon- one or two the next morning, wow. and that was a lot of those times we were covering distances of, um, you know, twenty to thirty miles on foot, you know, to get to a target, and Jeez. a lot of, um, you know, carrying, you know, hundred to hundred and twenty pounds of gear, you know, and getting into firefights, and it was all training. Of course, that was all to prepare us for combat, which you know was even harder. So interesting. People think the Navy SEAL preparatory training, the buds, you know, basic underwater demolition SEAL training, is the hardest. Hardest thing you could possibly do in the world, and and every SEAL will tell you that it's that's easy compared to actually training for combat. And we're going to get into some of the the Navy SEAL days, but um, I have to start off the conversation with as you know talking about SEAL Fit Kokoro Camp, and because I am <laughs> you I, I, I you're, you're training to do yourself. I, you know I I'm not going to put it past it because there's two different ones, right? There's a 50 hour one and then a week long one. Um, that is not quite accurate. There is a Kokoro camp is, it's 50 hours. It's always been 50 hours. Actually, you know, runs like 52 now. Okay. <laughs> you got a little bumps in there. <laughs> so, um, it's 50 hours plus of nonstop training and it's, that's modeled after the Navy SEALs hell week, which is 120 or 30 hours of nonstop training. Mm-hmm. There's no sleep, right? We say that room and board is covered in your uh, in your tuition because <laughs> you don't need any room. you don't need a room, and you're, you know you're fed you're fed. We feed you, but sometimes you're eating MREs and sometimes you're just cramming a you know a power bar down your your gullet. Um, we have a short version of the same type of training. We call that a crucible training. <clears throat> crucible meaning like you're you're smelting iron and turning into you know. Turning into steel or something. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like the crucible for the human spirit. Right. We have a short version of our crucible training called the 20X. Hmm. 20X. And that, you know, essentially is a metaphor that means you're capable of 20 times more than you think you are. And you find it out through seal fit training. Yeah. We had contemplated doing a week long, like a full hell week. Mm-hmm. Uh, we haven't pulled the trigger on it, on it yet, but I think someday we will do a full hell week as a standalone event. I don't, I don't know if it'll be a recurring event, but it'll be a standalone event. So how long is the crucible? Well, the crucible is 12 hours. Oh, the 12 hour. Yeah, I see. 12 hours. 20X is 12 hours. Okay. (laughs) That's 12 hours of training. I just remember here. We also do shorter versions of that for high school and football sports teams. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of their their coaches and families don't think that, you know, 12 hours is appropriate for their kids, even though we do. We think they'd be great at 12 hours. But so we do uh, six hour versions for the sports teams. You know, I remember just hearing Ben Greenfield saying it's one of the toughest things he's ever done, and that that alone says it's probably <laughs> just breaks people. Yeah, I, I've had a few Ironman athletes tell me it's uh, would it's akin as best they can imagine to doing three back to back full Ironmans in terms of the physical load. And mm-hmm. physical. So, what are some of the components of Kokoro? Well. You know, Kokoro is a completely unique experience. Um, we, you know, we say that you're going to meet yourself for the first time. It is a full immersion experience where we're developing you physically, mentally, emotionally, intuitionally, and spiritually. And you remember those, the five mountains yeah. from um, listening to my stuff or reading my book. Those five mountains, we believe, um, need to be trained or are best trained together in an integrated fashion when under pressure. And so the Kokoro camp experience provides the, the pressure and the pressure is provided by the time domain, the sleep deprivation, the intensity of what the coaches bring to the table. We have, you know, this program, we have uh, Navy, all my Navy SEAL coaches are former SEAL instructors. They put thousands of SEALs through training. Yeah. Uh, plus they've been trained up in, in my model or the SEAL fit model and they've conducted, you know, we're on our 40th Kokoro camp uh, next weekend actually. And so they're, they are literally 
masterful. I mean, they are the world's leading experts on human emotional development and psychology when it comes to performance under pressure. It's, yeah. it's amazing and very cool to watch you know, us all work together. And you know, the, the process essentially, it does go in that, those five mountain kind of patterns. First, it seems like a physical event, but you know, it's not about fitness. Kokoro Camp, you know, even though our name of our company is Seal Fit, if you're not fit when you get to it, you will not survive past the first hour or the right. first couple of hours. And so the first layer is to go through the physical um, your physical body basically and realize that this is really um, going to require more than what you can bring to the table with just your muscles and bones and sinews, right? Mm. Uh, working in, you know, functionally and, and, and well. So assuming that you've got the durability to withstand the physical load, then Kokoro Camp becomes about the mental domain. And so um, the mental domain meaning, you know, can you, can you, uh, deal with the constant change? Can you deal with the constant harassment and, and chaos and changing instructions and changing roles and all the mental challenges that are thrown at the group and as you, to you as an individual? Can you handle that? Guess what? After your first night of no sleep, your mind is starting to fray. And then it becomes more about emotional resiliency. Do you have the emotional strength, right, to just go the distance? You know, when when um, a coach opens up a wound and pours some salt in, do you have the emotional resiliency to overcome that and bounce back? And if you don't have that emotional strength, you're not willing to develop it on yeah. the spot, then you don't make it. And then the, f the fourth and fifth mountains really kind of come hap they come together at a certain point about midway through the camp where you just realize that you cannot, you, you just literally cannot do this alone. And then you have to open up, open up for help, open yourself up for help. You have to take your eyes off yourself, we say, and put them on your teammate. Mm. You have to be willing to be carried sometimes, right? Yeah. And so, so for big egotistical guys, this gets to be a challenge. And, um, and if you've got the strength, you really turn that strength to your teammates and help them get through the training. And now this starts to develop great team awareness, uh, more intuition, and more of a heart connection. And... Um, and, and you tap into your spiritual strength. It's, it's powerful. And you get into this uh, really cool flow state that lasts for hours and hours. And people, you know, um, after the camp, you know, in their testimonies, it literally takes several weeks to digest all the learning that's happening. And, and it stays with you for your entire life. Like, literally, they say there's, there's life before Kokoro Camp and then there's life after. Right. And everything after seems easy because of this, right. you know, this scenario that you put yourself through. But um, this whole idea that you're now connecting with your spirit and your heart was the purpose of me calling it Kokoro Camp because the mm. word Kokoro is Japanese meaning to merge your heart mm. and your mind into your actions. And so what we think is that the mind, you know, your, your thinking mind is clever. You can come up with, you know, with first order decisions that seem to make sense, but oftentimes they're not wise and they're not good for all concerned or good for the, you know, the environment or good for the team. And so you need the wisdom of your heart to ensure that decisions you're making that you know, your clever mind comes up with are going to be you know, grounded in, in, um, in wisdom so that there's you know, not second and third order consequences that are negative. Yeah. So when you first devised the program, Mark, what did you think was going to be the toughest part? And then later on, what did you find was actually the toughest part? Well... You know, from my own Hell Week experience, I knew that uh, sleep deprivation and cold were going to be the toughest part, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and for sure, those are right. They're just you know, the cold is insipid; it just seeps into you. Um, it it's you know, it, it's hard to deal with that, right? And even in Hell Week, you know, when we went through SEAL training, it's worse than Kokoro Camp because in Hell Week you're wet and sandy the entire week. And in Kokoro Camp, we really keep you wet and sandy maybe half the time. <laughs> so uh, it's not quite as cold, and it's, you know, it's only for 24 hours. And the sleep deprivation isn't, also is not quite as bad as Kokoro Camp or as a Hell Week because it's only for, you know, for two nights. But I think the most challenging part, and it's interesting because we're just having a dialogue about changing this, and I don't want to change it. My coaches you know, were proposing something different. Was, mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't want to give too much information, but it's an event that we have somewhere in the middle of the camp which requires just an un, unreasonable level of stick to right? And it's very uh, lonely, um, dark, um, 
painful, you know, uh, did I mention lonely, you know, <laughs> uh, evolution that lasts for many, many hours, mm. right? Many hours. And, um, and it just seems like it's never going to end, right? And that tends to be the most challenging part of the, the um, experience for most people um, when we talk to them afterwards. And they, they uh, tend to be hallucinating and mm. just have this major, you know, dark night of the soul moments, you know, where they just don't think they can even put their foot in front of another. And yet they find a way to keep going, you know, uh, through the help of a teammate, a kind word, you know, someone taking a backpack and helping them carry it or something like that. And, of course, my coaches, you know, unless you think that the coaches are all just these bunch of meanies, the reality is we're, we're trying to train mental toughness and resiliency through the experience. Right. So instead of sitting in a classroom, we set up the conditions for you to fail, and then we teach you how to step over that chasm and to, to get to the other side. And we know that, you know, we know whether it's a physical, mental, emotional, or even spiritual skill that you need to tap into. Yeah. And so we, um, we give you those skills and we teach you, um, we teach you mental toughness and how to, to find it in the moment when you're under pressure. Yeah, I mean, and not everyone makes it through. What percentage drops yeah. out? You know, it's different every camp. It's yeah. really interesting. You know, whereas the, the Navy SEAL training, you know, when I went through SEAL training, uh, we had 185 in my class. We had 19 people graduate, 19 wow. people. Yeah. Um, Kokoro camp, the stats are around uh, about flip-flop because we, we try, we really do strive to keep everybody in. Yeah. It's, it's just not possible. But a recent camp, I think two, two sessions ago, so maybe it was Kokoro 37, we had uh, 52 people enrolled. We had 44 show up. Mm. And so this is one of the issues we have is like really? people like, they think they're committed until they have to like get on a plane or actually drive here. And then they're like, oh my God, what am I doing? And they just don't show up. They, they just, you know, they forgive their entire enrollment fee. Not forgive, but they right. throw it away basically. Yeah. And so 44 showed up Jeez. and I think we graduated 31. Mm. So... You know, 30, 30, 31 people got through the training. What's the most common time period or is there a common um, thing that they're doing that they it causes them to drop out? Well, usually the drops happen within the first um, 18 hours. And uh, we have um, probably the, a third of those drop within the first hour. And that really? happens. Yeah, that happens because... Wow. Uh, they, didn't, they, they didn't have a good assessment of their preparation of their skills, right? Yeah. They had inadequate assessment. And, um, you know, if I were to use the terminology from my book, The Way of the Seal, their set point was way off. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they, they thought that they were far more competent physically than they actually were. And, th and this is a problem with a lot of people. They just don't know how to assess where they are compared to either a standard, an arbitrary, or a, you know, a, a systematic standard, or compared to a group of people who are striving to do similar work, you know, similar, you know, a similar goal. And this is also very true with those, you know, a good chunk of the SEALs don't even make it into training. You know, like a, a huge number of people show up to a class, and maybe, uh, maybe 60 or 70 percent of them actually will class up, because they're the 30, 40, 30 to 40 percent mm -hmm. didn't even belong there to begin with, right? Yeah. So then the second group are those who were had a pretty good assessment of their abilities, but they really just, their just bodies and minds weren't ready for, um, weren't quite ready. And it, and it could be a lot of things that factor into it. You know, it's for some people come from Europe, you know, it's a long way to travel if you don't set your travel schedules appropriately and give time for, you know, jet lag to wear off and you don't hydrate properly, then, then no matter how prepared you are, your body might just not comply yeah right? and so we have a lot of people who actually their bodies fail on them and you know we're able to recognize it what's going on and so we will give them you know an hour to recover and then we get back and get them back into training if yeah. their mind is re ready like if their mind says i'm still going to do this i just need time for my body to kind of spool back up again right. and then we get back back into training and they do great um but if their mind says you know hey my body's quit so i'm i'm i guess i'm out i've quit then we can't do anything to help them, mm -hmm. you know. And then the third layer is the the group of people who give it their best. They make it, you know, 10, 12 hours, sometimes longer. And then in the middle of that first night, at their first 
dark night of the soul moment, which happens m several times during the thing where they just are literally pressed against the wall and don't think they can continue, uh, they just quit. They buckle, right? And so it, it truly is an emotional or, or just a spiritual quit where they're just like, I can't do this. Uh, this is one for me. I'm not strong enough, right? And, and we, at those points, we can recognize what's happened. We try really hard. If we know it's not physical, that their body can handle it, um, oftentimes if we just get them through this moment, right, yeah. to the sunrise, they'll be fine. But um, we can't help everybody. You know, they, some people just insist that they're done and they're out. So, you know, it's it very different than how we, we, or, you know, Navy SEAL, how we, we don't actively, we don't rejoice when people quit. Right. Um, we know it's going to happen. We spend a lot of time with them trying to keep them in training. Um, you know, there's a program called Go Ruck Selection, and it's, you know, it's, it's not any harder than Kokoro. And they, you know, I think the last time they ran it, they didn't have anyone finish. And it's, it's because they do the opposite of what we do. Like, they don't allow you to talk to your teammates so you're all alone. They don't give you any food for the first 24 hours, so your body's already going to be really uh, crushed from that. And they set these really high standards that if you don't make the standards, you know, you're basically, you're out. Yeah. And so there's not a whole lot, of, I mean, uh, with all due respect to the Gurukh guys, there's not a lot of training that goes on there. That's just, hey, can I make it or can I, you know, am I going to be one of the 99% who doesn't? Uh, whereas with Kokoro Camp, you know, we really want you to come out of this a different person. Yeah. You know, the whole new concept of what's possible. Yeah. So you've been doing this for decades, Mark. How much can you tell right from the very beginning if someone's going to drop out or not? Uh, we're pretty good at uh, identifying um, folks who aren't going to make it. I would say we're, you know, we're 75 to 80% wow. good just by looking at people and how they move and, and their facial expressions and the look in the eye within the first hour of training. And my coaches will start pointing and calling people out. And, and sure enough, by the, you know, within 24 hours, they're usually pretty correct. Wow. What is it? What did they see or what do you see? You know, uh, fear, I think, is one of the biggest things. Like... Those people who adequately prepare and have the confidence that they're, you know, that they've got it, then you don't see the fear in their eyes. What you see is a growing sense of "I've got this." Mm -hmm. uh, once the initial shock and awe wears off, and they're like, "Okay, I know how to do this, right? I, I can do this. I just got to keep going, right? I just got to keep doing what I've done." And then they start to get, you know, this look in their eye that there's nothing that we could do to really hurt them. Whereas mm -hmm. The people who quit, they never feel like they're on top of it. They never feel, and so we say that they're feeding the fear wolf. They're not feeding the courage wolf. And then the more they feed the fear wolf with their internal dialogue, their imagery, yeah. and their emotional states, uh, the closer we can see them, you know, getting to a quit moment or a, or a quinjury, <laughs> which is really most injuries are essentially self-manifested uh, due to your internal dialogues. And so we call those quinjuries. You know, that's different than like running and twisting your ankle but even that you know as you know could be manifested by uh, internal thought patterns and whatnot i mean and you talk about this in the book about feeding the fear wolf or the courage wolf what was it there was a time what was the time for you that you were at that brink and you had to remember that and then what do you say to yourself in those moments well when you know, for me, I've I've learned uh, early on to notice um, my mental patterns and to take control of them very quickly, very early on. In fact, so uh, even it's by the time I got to SEAL training, um, I wouldn't allow the fear wolf to be fed. So I would start every day and start every evolution by feeding the courage wolf through my internal dialogue, yeah. and um, and so that that training has been extraordinarily valuable for me you know, for anything that I've done uh, hard in life. Um, but generally, you know, uh, let's say I do notice um, something, you know, happening um, where, where there's a negative kind of dialogue or negative uh, pattern starting to arise. The, the first, um, you know, the first order of business, Jeremy, is to, is to be able to notice that. Yeah. And so... Um, SEAL training and the, the Eastern traditions and yoga traditions with meditation and breath practices, and like I say SEAL training in there because it is very, very capable of training the same thing that I'm about to say, uh, is that they're all um, very good at allowing you or developing this ability to um, create space between um, what I call your witnessing mind and your thinking mind, right? And in this space, 
right? We, we learn to crack that open, and then within that space, we control time. Seals learn to control time by um, opening up that space so that they're not merged with their thoughts, and they can, then they take control of their thoughts, and they direct them toward um, what I call winning in the mind, and that's a combination of, of powerful and victorious internal dialogue, mm -hmm. uh, imagery that supports that, so you can always have a vision of what the win looks like, what mission success looks like, um, visual uh, imagery that supports your internal dialogue. So, you know, for me, when I was on these you know, arduous runs or swims, and my internal dialogue was feeling good, looking good, ought to be in Hollywood, the imagery associated with that was that I was strong, I was powerful, I was kicking ass, right. I was taking names. You know, I, I didn't have, like, imagery that was contradicting that. And then, um, and then to be able to connect an emotional state to that combination of, of imagery and dialogue. So I used to say that first you got to say it, Right then, you got to see it. Then you got to feel it. And if you can do those th three things, you could believe it. You'll believe that you're um, conquering. Right, and that's truly what I mean by feeding the courage wolf, which is our our science of positivity. Mm -hmm. Right, positivity is one of our big four skills of mental toughness that we develop through the Kokoro camp and through the the training. Yeah. So, Mark, what was? Thank you. That that helps me with hearing your internal dialogue and what that sounds like. Um, what was a person that surprised you? that actually made it through the Kokoro? Well, there's been m many actually, you know, some, uh, some women who just, you know, just would not ever give in, <laughs> surprise me. But generally, women have done very well in Kokoro. I would like to see more of them come. I think uh, a lot of them just don't think it's for them, but uh, the women who've gone through have been, you know, have found it to be an extraordinary experience. Um, and I, there's been some older um, individuals, right? I think uh, the oldest we've had is like 56 who have made it through. Uh, we had a 62-year-old guy um, who trains with us at headquarters every day, you know, mm. five days a week. So he didn't quite make it through last time, so he's going to try again. And I'm quite confident he'll make it through the second time. So he made it about 24 hours before yeah. his body, you know, just said, okay, I'm done. You know what I mean? Literally, I started to shut down on him. But this guy is a beast. His name is Dave Crandall, and um, he's going to take another run at it. Hmm. I don't know if it's this, this year or early next. What's been the one of the biggest breakthroughs you've seen someone have after going through it? You know, Jeremy, I, I get testimonials every week. Um, first, you have to understand that most people train for Kokoro Camp. So it, it doesn't, it's not like a one-time experience right. for them. It literally might be like a year-long odyssey. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, if you watch any of the it, videos online... If, right. I would think if you don't go in training for this right. for a year, I mean, right. you probably so won't make like, past the first hour. Right. So all the, tr the training makes you stronger. And I, yeah. I like to use uh, my friend Dan Sullivan, who uh, started Strategic Coach, had this, this formula. And I, I, it was so good that I've been using it ever since. And it's that once you commit to something, like commitment doesn't lead to confidence. But commitment opens up and develops courage. Because like mm -hmm. you commit, I'm going to Kokoro Camp. Now you're like, okay, now I've got to get ready, right? Because there's no turning back. Now, right. I'm talking about burn your boats, hair on fire, do or do not level yeah. of commitment. Because right. like the people who didn't show up at Kokoro Camp, you know, the 14 or so, they weren't really committed. Yeah. They had enrolled, they paid money, but their heart wasn't in it. And they probably didn't train. I'm talking about once you commit, then that's where you get really courageous. And that courage um, drives you to do what I call closing the gaps. Now, when you close the gap in your physical readiness. You find where you're weak and you shore it up, right? It, you close the gap in your mental toughness. You find where you're weak and you begin to train mentally. And that's new for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Same thing emotionally. Um, and, and so you close the gap and through that closing the gap, you develop the competency to succeed. And that combination of commitment, courage, and competency is what leads to total confidence. And so then, so over the course of the year, you're developing more and more of this, comp, uh, this confidence because your competency and your courage is going up, 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 and all backed by your commitment. And then when you get to the event, right, now it's a whole nother level that you have to just step it up. So you have to bring your, your entire being into that training. You yeah. cannot leave anything on the table. And it truly does awaken in you this unbelievable sense that you can do anything you can get through any crisis. You can handle yourself. Um, you become what I call sheepdog strong, right, for the rest of your life. And you also come out of it with a sense of, you know, what's next? I need to keep this rhythm going of training for and training and testing, training and testing. And so you know, the people who come through typically tend to 
stay connected, you know, because going through Kokoro camp, you know, it's kind of like a little baby version of me going through SEAL training. Most guys are my buds for life. You right. know, I share something that's radically unique with them. It's uncommon yeah. in, that I don't share with anybody else in the world. And so you stay connected and then you tend to do things together. You train together. You hold each other accountable. Yeah. And now you have a sheepdog team to, you know, to keep on growing with. It's very cool. Is it pretty common for people to do it with someone, to come in with someone, or do they do it alone? Well, for some people, it's a very solitary journey, and for others, um, you know, having a swim buddy is a really, or even a small team is is pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Still doesn't mean you're going to make it. For instance, we had uh, the top CrossFit Games team, um, Tommy Hackenbrook's uh, CrossFit Ute team. And these guys won the CrossFit Games, and um, then they came through Kokoro Camp, and one of their members didn't make it, hmm. right? Uh, the rest of the team members did. And, of course, we didn't even let them stay as a team. You know, sometimes we put them together, sometimes we broke them apart. But this kid struggled. And uh, fortunately, for, to his credit, he came back through a year later and just did an incredible job, right? So he, he identified a weakness in that. Here's this guy who was literally one of the fittest in the world. Right, yeah. And he didn't make it through the training. What was the breakdown? I, I think it was largely, you know, for him it was mental, right? Mental fortitude, just, you know, just, you know, he's a short CrossFit, as you know, is a short burst, you know, short muscle twitch, you know, all the workouts are anywhere from six minutes to 20, you know, it's very rare to do something longer, and then maybe there's an hour-long workout every once in a while. And so um, he just had never really expected that he was going to have to work as hard as we asked him to work for 50 hours straight, you know. He just right. didn't train properly. Yeah. And so even though he was fit enough to do it because his other teammates had trained the same way as him, he just his mind couldn't make that leap and he couldn't shift his, uh, his energy states, I guess. Yeah. For the Mark, Mark, I want to go back early on and a big influence for you growing up. I know there was – your dad and your brother and your family business, what was a big influence for you when you were growing up? Well, um, my dad was a big influence in a lot of ways, both positive and negative. You know, he, in the positive side, he taught me the value of really hard work. I mean, we were essentially um, like a, a slave tribe for him. You know what I mean? <laughs> he put my oh, brothers and I, actually it was my, my older brother and I to work incessantly, you know, after school and on the weekends and chopping wood and, you know, mowing and, you know, just whatever, painting. Yeah. And uh, we had um, a pretty big old historic house in upstate New York that, you know, you could work on it 24 hours a day and the thing would still fall apart <laughs> before you got done. You know? <laughs> anyway, so that was really cool. And then in the, in the summer times, we spent our time up in the Adirondack Mountains, 6 million acres of protected wilderness, mm. 5,000 freshwater lakes and some beautiful mountains. And my dad loved hiking. And so... Very early on, he had me and my brother out hiking with him. And you know, we go out 18 to 22 miles a time mm. with a small load. You know, at that age, I wasn't carrying a lot of weight, so maybe 20 pounds on my back or something like that. But you know, just getting used to being out hiking up and down those hills and learning to, um, you know, just again, manage my internal dialogue and learn to enjoy that, right? Learn to enjoy the, both the journey and the destination. Learn to enjoy the majesty of the of the views on top of those peaks. It's just stunning. And so I, through my father, I just learned to love, I learned to love nature and I learned to love silence. I was very comfortable being alone. And so later on, um, you know, I would just go out and do it on my own and I would run up these mountains. I would literally run them, you know what I mean? Mm. And, and then I would wrap my ankles at the top and I would and put knee pads on and then I would run down. Mm. And the reason I did the ankles and knee pads is because those are very rocky trails with lots of roots and stuff and so there were times where I was doing wow. somersaults and you know I used to play tag with a, a friend of mine who rode crew for Harvard and we, we would run up Whiteface Mountain and then play tag on the way down <laughs> of course people thought us you know us nuts as we were but <laughs> it's great fun so you said there was good and there was some negative yeah th I mean my dad was volatile um you know he he's gotten a lot better in his older age and he's still really healthy I think it's 78 now but huh. you know he, he was pretty volatile um and angry, uh, and so, and and his dialogue was a lot about feeding fear wolf, and so there wasn't a ton of positivity the way I teach it or the way I practice it myself in in the household, and so that as anyone who's listening who grew up with violence and and um, 
that type of emotional turbidity will know is it's tough because it, it gets gro- grooved pretty deeply inside of you. Yeah. Uh, that's the stuff that you know therapists work with all the time. And so I've done my share of therapy and EMDR. You know, I I yeah. worked a lot of that, right? And EMDR, I found to be extremely. You talk about EMDR in the book. My wife's a psychologist, and Is so she? yeah, so I'm somewhat familiar with it. What made you like get on that path and discover it? Well, I didn't even discover that until I was like in my late forties, because mm-hmm. you know, even with all the work I'd done as a seal, as a martial artist, meditating, you know, uh, what I I learned is that. You can do all, you know, all the work of that, what I'm talking about, like meditation, concentration, breath work, physical training, mental training, all of that is what I call transcendent work. It's, it's designed to, to elevate your consciousness, to increase your, your um, lines of development along your physical, mental, emotional, intuitional, spiritual, so that you, you, you become more, right? You yeah. see the world more. You can take greater perspectives. You can understand other people better. You elevate your plateau, essentially. Uh, and you can grow, right? Developmental psychologists have mm-hmm. known now that we can grow. Well, the challenge with that is that it only works to a certain extent because we all have a shadow side to us, right? And some have more shadows than others. And if you grow up in a, a negative or violent um, home, then you're going to have some pretty significant shadows. And th- this is like, again, the regression work, gestalt therapy, you know, um, mm-hmm. Jungian type stuff. Yeah. And so I, I, I noted that I had a lot of that stuff that was holding me back. You know, I'd have great success and I'd trip up and it was mm. because of some emotional pattern or belief system or something. And so, I, of course, I endeavored to work on myself at that level. Yeah. Um, but what I also noticed was it was hard to think your way to health perfectly, right? So sometimes, you know, it's like, you know, when you think about something, you actually bring energy to it when you're trying to dissolve that energy. Yeah. It's one of the reasons that just talk therapy isn't always successful. And so I heard about uh, EMDR, which was um, developed by some woman who found that, you know, by tracking eye movement, she was able to affect uh, uh, healing in a, yeah. um, in, in a pain, I think it was a pain or grief victim. Yeah, my wife used it for like a Katrina victim. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah she wanted to survive exactly. the Katrina. And it works yeah. at a nervous system level. Yeah. And so the woman and I did, it was very cool. We used a combination of EMDR and visualization to kind of go back to er- very early childhood memories mm. and to repattern them. And, um, and the reason I did this is because no matter how much I th- knew about my upbringing and how much I knew how it affected me, patterns still were kind of evolving that were nervous system patterns that I had no control over. Right. Right? I could sit there and going, I-, I don't even know why I'm doing this right now. Like, why am I, why is the energy... And the words coming out of my voice have this like angry edge to them when I'm not angry. Right. You know what I mean? Stuff right. like that. And so EMDR just like cleared it up beautifully That's in a amazing. few sessions. One of the cool things, Jeremy, about Seal Fit and Unbeal Mind is, you know, I think that, you know, I've been teaching yoga and I've been teaching visualization and meditation and breath control to SEAL candidates since 2007. Right. And they've been soaking it up because it's coming from, Mark, you know, it's coming from Commander Mark Devine. And, right. and I'm able to very clearly prove to them, <clears throat> because I put them out under the log or you know, on the beach, right afterwards, I can prove to them how valuable it is for mm. developing mental toughness, concentration, the ability to control your physiology and your psychology while you're under stress. And so they're like, I get it. Right, but if if someone just said, "Hey, Navy Seal or Navy Seal candidate, you know, you should go see go to a yoga class," they think you were know, your flake. Like that yoga's for sissies or yoga's only well, for girls. you have street credibility. Yeah, but, uh, and not just street creds, but I'm able to articulate it yeah. and teach them in a way that's very practical for them because yeah. that's the way I used it myself. Right. Yeah, and that, that's kind of the the crux of um, my latest book. It's called Warrior Yoga. And so, right. Someone asked me to put that together in a book, you know, how I taught the SEALs, and so I'm, I've done that. It'll come out in uh, April of 2016, and we have a program kind of called Warrior Yoga, although I, I, um, I realized li- too late in the game that there is a trademark out there, so we may have to change the name, <laughs> uh, unless we can work something out with that. I mean, so you went from, Mark, you went from swimming at Colgate to MBA to CPA, so what made you, what motivated you to become a Navy SEAL then? Well, it's, you know, it's, a, it's probably a, uh, the answer that would take longer than we have here. And I wrote about it in my book, The Way of the Seal. Yeah. Um, it is, 
I think that um, the, the gist of it is that I started uh, training in a martial art. My first experience with some of these tools that we've been talking to came from a martial artist, a uh, grand master, enlightened master named Tadashi Nakamura at a school in New York called Sado. I had just started um, working at um, PricewaterhouseCoopers. It used to be called Coopers and Librand back then. And I was going to NYU at night to get my MBA. Yeah. And I stumbled across this school literally at uh, one night walking home from work. And I just walked up into it and I was blown away. I was like, this is really cool. I want to do this. So I joined the next day. And what was cool about it is, you know, we did hardcore physical training. I mean, it was a hardcore fighting karate style. Yeah. But, but we meditated before and after every class for like three to five minutes. And then he was very, um, Nakamura was very uh, encouraging of us to come to a Thursday evening um, meditation class that was followed by a uh, discussion, like a lecture. And so I attended those religiously, and it was 45 minutes of meditation. Wow. Uh, and what happened is over a period of like a year to a year and a half, it took me a long time to be comfortable sitting in silence and then to be able to control my mind. I mean, it was disastrous at first, and most people have that experience. Yeah. But I stuck with it, you know, and, and I just kept going and kept going and kept going. And I noticed that no matter how lousy I thought I was about meditating, that I, it was still having some effect. It was, it was working, right? Yeah. And so I, started, I stopped looking at it as like in a performance art, you know, and started looking at it as just sitting, you know, just enjoying that time in silence and just letting the thoughts settle. And then over time, when I stopped trying so hard, my thinking mind would just slowly, so finally settle down and it would open me up, right? And what, what I mean by that is things would start coming up and insights and inspirations and thoughts that I never had before. And what came up was that, you know, essentially I was a complete misfit in this career that I had chosen because mm. I didn't choose it for me. It was chosen for me. It was chosen for me by family, by my family's belief systems, by society, by my peers at Colgate. I was kind of following the herd. Mm. There all these reasons that I... I was kind of drawn into this, but it really wasn't about me, truly, mm -hmm. like deep down, coming from who I was, what my sense of purpose was, my felt sense of purpose, what, what I was passionate about, and it didn't even align with my principles, because you know I wasn't really about the money and the position and the power and all this stuff, and I really didn't want to go back to the family business when I finally asked those questions, and so that process of sitting on the bench and just settling your mind brought that up. And then, of course, I had to ask, if not that, then what? Right, right. right. And then I started to ask better questions. And, you know, the quality of your life is determined largely by the quality of the questions you ask. So I started asking mm -hmm. better questions. Like, okay, if, that, if this whole thing is a myth, then what is my purpose? What is my reason for existence? Right. Why am I here and what am I going to do about it? And how can I do something about it that I'm super passionate about that gets me fired up every day? And so um, when I started to ask those questions, of course, imagery and sensations are coming up that I was meant to be a warrior and a leader. Hmm. And then I started to look at areas where that, I could play that out hmm. uh, as a career or in, a, you know, in some way that was meaningful. And, and I kind of narrowed it down to the military. And this is a big surprise to me because you know, I didn't grow up in a military family. Right. Um, my dad did go to the Army for two years, but it's because a judge told him to go. You know? <laughs> so Not by choice. He wasn't yeah. a big fan of the military. Right. No. no really was in upstate New York, you know, it's kind of like you do that if you can't figure out what else to do. Right. Um, and so I had to overcome all that. And, you know, I just said, I settled on the seals and that was a kind of a different story too, but it kind of, the seals kind of came to me, right, when I was ready. Yeah. And, that, and then I, when I locked on that, I said, that's it, right? And so that started the whole process to get in. And so how was the transition after, from after the seals then you started the brewing company, but in the, in between there, how is that transition? It's got to be a difficult transition when you are doing something for so long and you know it, and then you change yeah. to something completely different. I think it's a, it's a difficult transition when you're coming from a, a a team and a culture and a system like the Seals that is highly evolved. It's mm -hmm. you know it, it 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 gets you to you know the system and the team conspire to elevate your own standards, yeah. right, and hold you accountable. And everyone performs much better when they're plugged into that yeah. energy, right? And so a lot of the SEALs perform remarkable feats because they've got a teammate on each side of them that expected of them. Right. And they've got a system and leaders that expected of them. You know what I mean? It's 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 amazing experience. And so as soon as you're, you, know, you decide to, to leave that service or you retire, then the very next day, you're, you're, all that is gone. Right. 
and, and a lot of people really struggle. A lot of SEALs really struggle, and not just SEALs, but Marines and others, but sure. it's particularly acute in the SEALs because of the, the intensity of the training and the danger and the risk that we take on. And so, you know, I, ha- I experienced a little bit of that. And what helped me was I actually stayed in the reserves. I got off active duty and I stayed in the reserves, which allowed me to every month go down and, you know, check in with my guys, mm. continue to jump and dive and even go to war. Uh, but at the same time, I was, a, I was a part-time warrior, right? And so I was able to get back into business and, and pay, you know, spend time with my family and figure out the future. But I would say the other big thing that really surprised me is that I had come to expect a level of, uh, trust and professional respect in the military that was uncommon in the business world. Mm-hmm. And so I took it for granted and I got my butt handed to me in my first business big time because the people that I partnered with and worked with really did not have the same level of, of trustworthiness, uh, of, uh, of ethical you know, guidelines or morals. And, um, and you know, I just was taking that. I was looking at them like a SEAL team teammate when they really weren't and they didn't have my interests at heart either. And so the, the whole business kind of like got a little bit challenging and I ended up, you know, it wasn't worth me staying in because the family was starting to get really pulled apart and, the, and my partners were my brothers-in-law. And so I just basically walked away. I sold them my interest and started NavySeal.com, you know, about a, six months later. Yeah. I mean, cause what was the height of the brewing company? What was the height like? The height of the success financially, well, because there's other stuff going on behind the scenes, also. Right? Yeah, the business the business was successful at a structural level. You know, I, I talk about the three spheres in the book. The three spheres that we live in are the I sphere, our, our felt sense of who we are, our values. You know that that notion of what my purpose is. So that's all your interior. And every one of us, every human being on the planet, has unique you know, DNA signature. Not physically, they although that's true too, but of who they are, their consciousness. And then, then the second place sphere that we live simultaneously is the we sphere. Anytime we interact with another, another human being, it changes us. It, and it creates a morphogenic field that we call the team or the we or the shared sense of self. And we call that culture when it's more than two people, right? So a team can have a culture, a company can have a culture, obviously a country can have a culture. And then there's the it sphere, and the it is the cold, rigid structures, rules, you know, systems, right, that define how you work, you know, and the SEALs had an it, and they had a culture, and then they, each SEAL had their own I experience. Well, when I was in the SEALs, like I mentioned, that was all very powerful, and all of them were completely aligned, you know what I mean, for success, yeah. for mission success. When I started the brewing company, the system was completely non-existent because it was an entrepreneurial organization. We had to, like figure out what the rules are. Usually when someone said, hey, what's, you, you need a rule for this. And we're like, we do? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do other people do? You know what I mean? And it wasn't always the right thing for us. But the rules were very loose because they were being defined every day. And um, the team culture was very, very awkward because we didn't share values. We didn't share the same vision. Um, our, our idea of mission success was different. This I'm talking about my core team. Yeah partners. And, um, and so the culture was um, rotten, so to speak, mm. right? And then that change, that affected my internal sense of self. My eye space became, you know, more, um, a little bit more stress. Um, I had a lot of tools to handle the stress, but again, you know, I was carrying the load of trying to like raise all the money and I pretty much started the business myself. Um, these guys did not meet their commitments. They didn't invest side by side with me. They literally just came along and for the ride, and then yeah. you know, they got a free business out of it, a free retirement that's worth now twenty million dollars probably this today. Wow. Um, anyways, th- that having said all that, the height of the business was um, when I was able to open the doors. You know, in um, I think it was November of nineteen ninety six, and I got off. I had gotten off active duty in April, so here I was. You know, active duty seal starting the business plan. I wrote the first business plan, first of three. I started raising money back in November, December, the prior year. I ended up you know, continuing that process. I got out of the Navy in April, and by November, the business was launched, wow. and it was a huge success. And yeah. so the first, the first few months were really euphoric, very cool experience to get this business open, have cash flow coming, and even though we were you know, negative cash flow. And... Um, I mean, just some really cool things happened, too, during that time frame. But, so it wasn't until a few months after that that I, I really started to see 
that I had made some mistakes with, you know, the formation of the partnership and mm -hmm. communication strategies and not aligning our visions and all the things that right. I teach now are very important to starting a business. I just had completely and, you know, ignorantly ignored. <laughs> so it started to fall apart. So, Mark, putting that aside for a second, there were, what worked well? Badly. What's that? Sadly. <laughs> yeah. What worked well, though, with launching? Because obviously it was uh, upward trajectory, sure. large success. What was, what was working well with what you did with launching the company? Well, I think um, what worked well was that I was smart enough to, A, A use kind of my Navy SEAL and MBA skills to, to get the business open and to, to make some decisions that often were unpopular, uh, but that I knew would, um, would make the business a big success. Yeah. Right. What was so, unpopular? What was an unpopular decision? Um, what would be one example? It's not, you know, I'm not having one come to me, but I think, you know, spending some, um, we had a lot of battles about the design of the business, for mm -hmm. instance, um, with my partners, and I really wanted the business to look the way it is now, like a beautiful brick building with the brass kettles and a wood-fired pizza, so when you walk in, you saw, you know, brick and brass kettles for the brewing equipment, and then, in the, you know, in the distant corner kitchen, you see the mm -hmm. fireplace and the fire and lots of warmth and activity, and I really... Um, got that from growing up in upstate New York where, you know, there was always a fire going and, you know, the warmth would draw, you know, draw you in of that fire and the colors were very kind of rich, earthy colors. And I thought, you know, that, that's something that really kind of is lacking in Southern California. And for a brewery, you know, we were like the second or the third brewery in yeah. San Diego. I thought that would be really cool. And I wanted to be very classy. Right. And, um, my, um, one of my partners really initially just wanted it to be kind of a tap house, you know, with lots of beer. And, and so I pushed to have uh, it be, be a full-scale brewery, you know, which is going to cost us a lot more money. But I wanted it to be a destination that, you know, people would come from mm -hmm. all over San Diego to visit, not just the local residents. Yeah. So those were some decisions that, you know, affected cash flow or affected, you know, how much money I needed to raise. It's like a long-term vision that you have. Yeah. Right? Vision was, and I wanted, oh, the other one was I, I really wanted it to be a multi-unit operation that, um, that provide, this is probably the biggest one. I don't know why I didn't think this right away. It's the reason everything fell apart is, you know, I was trying to grow a business that provided a solid return to the investors and the shareholders as well as the owners and uh, that could be scaled and it wasn't, you know, uh, a lifestyle business that kind of trapped me in a job right. all the time. You know what I mean? And so um, I started, you know, I, I, I had verbal discussions with my partners about that, but they, you know, and they never really, like, got on board with it. And I, they just nodded their head kind of, and I could, t I could really tell that they weren't on board at the time because I maybe was just closed off to their ideas. and I didn't really ask them. I kind of told them. And sure enough, when I started executing on that plan is when, you know, things started to fall apart because they didn't share that vision. And they really just wanted to kind of have this bit place and slowly buy out all the other shareholders at a discount, right? So they own the whole thing and then they could, you know, have their free beer and free food and, mm. you know, a nice investment over a long period of time. And essentially that's what they've done since I sold them out. And they have grown it, but, um, you know, it uh, hasn't provided any return for the shareholders whatsoever. Is that something, Mark, I mean, this is very, I hear this every day. Is that something that you think was avoidable at the time? Or do you think it just is part of business that now you know, like what would you have looked for Well, now? I think in hindsight is 2020, right. uh, still pretty young. I was like 32 or so yeah. when I started that. Um, I certainly would do it a lot different now. And so and I, if I had had a Mark Devine to talk to, to tell me that, hey, you know, you got to um, make sure you're going into business with the right people for the right reasons and even at the right time. Yeah. And ultimately, I, I think I could have done the brewing company, you know, either alone or I would have done a different business uh, that was more aligned with my future business, like mm -hmm. my future purpose, like SealFit. Yeah. Uh, it didn't need to be a brewing company. There's a lot of negative things around owning a business that's purpose is to provide alcohol to people, you know, so... <laughs> At the time, I thought free beer for life as a Navy SEAL sounded good, but wow, boy, you know, does it come a lot with a lot of baggage? Yeah. I can so I can't believe you own NavySeals.com. Yeah. That's I bought amazing. The, uh, 
I got the URL in 1996 or seven for 35 bucks. Unbelievable. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's been t- difficult to, to turn, you know, to find a business model for, you know, we did e-commerce for a while. We still have an e-commerce store there, but you know, that's a, that's a rough model. It worked really well in the beginning because we were a niche retailer kind of yeah. um, providing tactical gear and, and stuff for, uh, for uh, individuals who were kind of interested in SEALs and special ops. But after 2008, then the market just literally evaporated almost mm. overnight. Really? Our business dropped off by 90%, <laughs> uh, almost wow. put me out of business. And that was one of my inflection points, one of the reasons I, I really dove into SEAL Fit. Uh, I had conceived the SEAL Fit and I launched my, my CrossFit gym. Uh, but after 2008, all my revenue just dried up and uh, I needed to get busy with SEAL Fit. And so we really kind of put a lot of energy into that. But the other thing about um, that's proving to be super useful with NavySeal.com is first of it, you know, it's the place that it's the first website that you'll come across on any type of search about the seals. And we provide a ton, a ton of free recruiting. We don't ask a dime of the Navy. Uh, ultimately, I think the Navy should be the the rightful owner of that domain someday. Right. You know, but they've got to they've got to buy it from me. I'm not going to hand it over to them because I've invested so much money in there. You know what I mean? But yeah. you know, that offer is up there if anyone from the Navy is listening to this. Um, and also like our Facebook group is over a million people. Wow. And, uh, so it's really cool platform for us to, you know, just introduce people to my training ideas and methodologies yeah. and have a positive impact. Like we try to keep it very positive and, um, you know, uh, uplift the, uh, seals and, you know, the positive side of what we're, uh, what we're accomplishing. And it's not political at all. I've stayed you know, away from all politics and, um, any any kind of sensationalism and just a, it's a cool platform to have. Yeah, and Mark, so you decide, okay, I'm going to create Seal Fit. Okay, mm-hmm. what was your vision then? Because now it's a twenty thousand square foot training center. What was your vi- your vision in the beginning? A twenty thousand square foot training center right? with uh, events being held around the world. It was the same. It right. was the same. Hundred hundred million dollars in revenue, and so that yeah. was my vision. And yeah. we're not there yet but we're we're moving you know one brick at a time closer to that we've never done any marketing except for just our social media and the videos that you see yeah like internal marketing uh we've got our own uh, i'm starting to produce our own re- reality tv show which will mm. launch later this fall it'll cool. be called seal fit and that's going to be about the business about the coaching staff and about you know the people who come you know who who deign to come through our events uh that should be really neat um I am launching a certification program. In fact, it's one of the things I'm preparing for. We run our first certification on Thursday and Friday. It's mm. we call it the basic training cert, yeah. which is more of a practitioner cert to teach people how to do our training model more effectively. And then that will pre-qualify them or qualify them to come to l- later on to an advanced training cert, which would be a coaching cert. We're then, so we're going to start growing a um, body of, of certified seal fit coaches to help teach seal fit, to bring it into schools and, and to do different things with it. And... Um, so I think, you know, in five years that, that original vision will be there, right? We'll be in every you know, be in a lot of different countries. We're running our first event in Italy in April mm. next year. Oh nice. Uh, Kokoro, well not a Kokoro, but a basic training cert, a twenty X and uh, a warrior yoga seminar all kind of bolted together. So it's working and um, we've been patient. You know, I don't have I have one small investor who's pretty silent, uh, someone who came through my training. Um, but other than that, you know, I pretty much own the business and, you know, my coaches are very loyal and exceptional human beings and, yeah. um, and my staff is amazing, you know, and, and some of my family now, uh, my, my immediate family, not my brother-in-law, uh, obviously, um, right. work, you know, my, my stepson and my stepdaughter-in-law and my other stepdaughter and even my wife, we all you know, work on the business. It's cool. The training center is yeah. our, is our laboratory. Yeah. Uh, business isn't tied to the training center. We got events going on sometimes two or three in a weekend, but we call the training center HQ or headquarters. It's kind of like Mecca. Right. Uh, if, if people want to train, if they want to train with me in our immersion academies, they got to come, they got to come to San Diego and do it because I'll do three days, five days. And then we have the spec ops academy, which is 18 days. And I'm at all of those. And I just, mm. I just love those because that's when I can get really deep into the full training model, working out and working in cover every single, you know, um, every single topic and everything that we need to cover. And uh, it's cool to see the breakthroughs that happen in those. And those are live-in events. They live on site with us. And we train from 5 in the morning to like 8 at night, sometimes mm-hmm. around the clock. And it's pretty cool. That's amazing. What has changed? I mean, you have a lot of programs. 
you know, from the very beginning, what programs did you introduce that you thought would work really well and maybe you had to change it or that wasn't working? And, you know, what, I guess, what was some of the evolution of the programs that you came up with? Yeah, there have been a working? few of them. The Kokoro Camp was a hit right away. I mean, yeah. it wasn't like, it's not like we ever got a lot of numbers, but it was just super successful, super yeah. effective, right? And the very f- first one of those I ran in 2008, and so we, we've evolved it, but that, that Kokoro Camp model has just been amazing. In 2000, uh, when, I, when I, I had this epiphany that, hey, I've got this, you know, this training center. I didn't have the entire 20,000 square feet, and I, and I don't own the building, right? I lease it. But um, I slowly been picking off you know, to where I could develop my vision, which was to have like a bud-style compound. And, and when I had that, as soon as I had that ready, like I didn't even, it wasn't deliberate, but like, the idea popped in my head to invite people here to live with me because we had an, a, one of our um, spaces is actually an apartment, a really nice apartment, mm. and I was using it as my office. And so I was like, what if we use this actually as an apartment and put bunk beds in here? And so I literally just threw it out to my, uh, to my email list and said, hey, I'm going to run a 30-day immersion academy. Here's what we're going to cover. Uh, you're going to come live with me. You know, I'm going to train with you every day. Yeah. And um, I remembered some, you know, of course, BUDS was like that. It was immersion of training. But even when uh, after BUDS, some of my most effective training was when I went away and just did nothing but focus on the training. We yeah. ate, slept, and trained. And I wanted to create that experience for civilians and also for SEAL candidates. Yeah. The first one of these, um, I got four people enrolled in. I charged $3,000 for it, which is dirt cheap. 30 days of training with Mark Devine. That was wow. back in 2010 or 11. And I ran four of those that first year. And then uh, I think I ran four of them the next year, and then more and more people started to come. And then I realized that was just a hard, you know, it was for 30 days, four times a year was tough for me time-wise. So yeah. I started to play with different um, durations. So uh, I launched, I, I shortened it up to um, three weeks, and then I created a one-week version. And all of these have been successful, but I think one of the most successful ones was one that we literally created this year. And notice they're going shorter. I thought, you know, still one week, it's kind of hard for people. What if we and, and also we require a lot of physical preparation for those yeah. those trainings. Like this is the PhD program, and I thought, well, I bet you there's a lot of people who would just love to come and learn the fundamentals, you know, without having to have prereqs. And so, right. I created a three day fundamental academy where you still come and live on site with me over three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Right. But you don't have to be Superman or Supergirl. You know, you could be anybody. And uh, gosh, I mean, we had a 67 year old woman come and uh, do it, and she mm-hmm. just thought it was amazing and we had this one girl named Kisten who lost 40 pounds just to prepare for it even though that wasn't the idea but just right. the idea that she was going to do this yeah. caused her to really step her game and then um, I mean gosh you know she, a year later she's lost like over 100 pounds wow. and she's just starting to become a fire breathing dragon I can't wait it's to amazing. see her again yeah so that's really worked now some of my off-site programs with high schools and colleges uh, I've just needed to kind of find a model because you know we're a high touch it's a high touch, very, you know, intimate training that we do, and it, it's hard for us to deliver it for cheap, right? I mean, for us to make any money, ten thousand dollars or eighty-five hundred dollars is like a minimum to be able to do an event with an organization, like a high school or something. And a lot of these high schools, they just don't have the budget for that. Right. So we're still trying to work around that. I think ideally that would be in like a nonprofit or sponsored, you know, kind of model. But mm-hmm. uh, that'll come. So, Mark. Since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask, what's been the lowest moment and how you push through? You know, um, I've had a couple low moments. One was um, before SealFit in 2006, it's actually one of the inspirations for SealFit, um, I had a business that was doing government contracting, right? For the, mm. so I had, U.S. Um, tactical. Yeah, I gotten yeah. out of the brewery. I did a couple things like a mobilization. I got recalled to, to go to um, the Middle East, and you know, so I sold the business and uh, brewing company. I think in two thousand and one, and did a couple other things. And then by two thousand and five, I had NavySeals.com kind of up and running, and uh, I was in dialogues with the seals because um, I was still a reservist, right? And they were talking about how, and you know, still the war on terror is going on now, and how can we increase the the quality of seal cannons going in the front door, in the pipeline, so that we can get uh, more of them through. So we can increase the seal size of the seal force. Congress wanted to increase by 500. But you can't do that without reducing standards. 
unless you do something differently. And we didn't want to reduce standards, thank God. So right. um, one of the solutions was to create a nationwide mentor program where we mentored the SEAL trainee candidate before they even went to boot camp. And I put a bid in for this. Uh, I had some experience with it through my mentoring through NavySeal.com. I ended up getting, uh, as a subcontractor, a prime contractor was awarded, uh, was doing the bid or the um, outsourcing, and they awarded it to my company and mm. launched this program called the Naval Special Warfare Mentor Program. And it was a huge success. We took the pass rate on the, on the Navy SEAL screening test from 33% to over 87% Amazing. in the first year. Yeah. Now, that wasn't throughput of buds. That's a whole different number, so we don't want to confuse that. At any rate, um, there was a small company back east, and I say that facetiously because they're over a billion-dollar company called Blackwater, right? Blackwater had bid on that same contract, and they were ticked that they didn't get it, right? And uh, unbeknownst to me, the founder of Blackwater, a guy named Eric Prince, who was a Navy SEAL, but a wealthy guy. You know, he was, he, when his parents died or his father died, he inherited a billion dollars. Well, he and his sister did. And uh, anyways, I got rumors that he was like prowling the halls of, of, uh, of the Pentagon, uh, talking to people, saying that he wanted, you know, that contract belonged to him, you know, he was the right company to do it, and blah, blah, blah. And sure enough, about uh, toward the end of the, the first year, and this is supposed to be a five-year contract, toward the end of the first year, I, I get word that the prime contractor has been challenged based upon their size. They're supposed to be a small business and, and someone was challenging them. Well, it was Blackwater. And then sure enough, uh, they found some glitch and the entire contract got thrown out. Wow. And under normal circumstances, they would take the little pieces and say, well, hey, subcontractor A, U.S. Tactical, you're, you're doing a great job. And the, the client who was Navy Recruiting Command wanted us to keep doing the job to sole source it to us. And they wouldn't do that. And so, sure enough, they put the entire thing out to a full and open bid to any size company, and there I was bidding against Blackwater again. And, and sure enough, they uh, awarded it to Blackwater. And when I had a, um, I finally had a phone debrief with the contracting shop that did the awarding, which was in Blackwater's backyard, basically right up the road in Norfolk. Blackwater runs hundreds of millions of dollars, so who knows how many dinners they've, you know, taken these guys out and right. whatnot. I finally got a um, uh, a phone call with them and said, hey. You, can you tell me we're doing the work? You know, we we invested a lot of money in this. It's we are hugely successful. The client loves us, and they said, "Well, Blackwater's staffing plan was superior to yours," and then, and we awarded to them based on that. And the next day, Blackwater hired every one of our guys for that contract. Mm. It was a total bait and switch, and it wow. was it's basically fraudulent. And um, everyone was encouraging me to fight it, and I was like, "Nah, you know, I don't want to fight that." But it was a real, you know, like I felt like I was just. Backstab. Really or just run through with a, a long knife because this was, you know, a huge opportunity for us. But, you know, I just sat down and reflected upon it. And I said, you know what? First of all, I don't have the energy to fight it. I don't want to fight a billion dollar company that's not going to go well for me. Um, I learned a lot, uh, but I didn't like government contracting. It wasn't really that satisfying for me. And I wanted to do something, you know, back to like, what's my purpose? What's my passion? I went back and started to ask those questions again. And it wasn't to be a government contractor. It was to train people. And I, mm. I really wanted to train these, these candidates. And so, you know, the idea is like, well, why don't I do this on my own? You know what I mean? Why don't I create a business where the, the athletes can contract with me instead of get it for free from the government? And those who are really serious about becoming SEALs and Green Berets mm. and Army Rangers, they will come. I trusted it. And so that was the, that was the uh, initiation for, or the inspiration for SEAL Fit. Yeah. Making lemonade out of the lemons. Yeah, Mark, thanks for sharing that. That's that is a tough, uh, tough story. And last question, Mark, what's been the proudest moment for you looking back? Oh man, there's been so many of them, but I think my, one of my proudest moments was to be at the uh, birth of my adopted son. Hmm. We adopted him um, from Hawaii. He's actually part Hawaiian. Uh, you never know. He looks like me, but uh, except he's got uh, blonde hair and brown eyes. He was born in Maui General Hospital mm. uh, to a Hawaiian mom, and um, we adopted him. We were there. It was pretty. I mean, we weren't actually in at the room. The birth, yeah. In the room, but right. as soon as he was born, you know, he was brought to us, and it was just an amazing moment. And um, you know, being able to raise him as my son, yeah. Devin is his name. It's just been awesome. You know, it's just yeah. It's amazing. I wouldn't what was that it. like, um, anticipation-wise, when you 
flew out well, there. Well, if your anyone wind. who's listening has ever adopted it, it's a yeah. it's a very anxious process. I mean, it's it's a roller coaster. I don't care who you know. I, I think at least half of adoptions fail, and so you you get you know you get committed to this process and these people, and they say they're going to follow through, and a lot of times they don't. They back out or right. something changes. Um, you know, for those who do overseas adop- adoptions, it's even worse. You know, you just don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And so, um, you know, for us, fortunately, it really worked out. But we had a, a moment of real intensity, like the the, the birth or the um, the um, the baby was born on a Friday, which meant that um, it, instead of it being an overnight, you know, and then the woman was going to be released because she had a C-section. And they would say, hey, through Monday because of staffing or whatever, just their policy. And that gave the mom, the birth mom, a whole weekend to bond with the kids, which mm, they right. against with the kid, right? And so she started asking for him, and she started, and, and legally they have to bring the baby, you know, bring this and son. And you, you would understand, right? She just gave birth to this. Of course, she wants to see it. Well, she started to bond with this, and she started to change her mind. Oh, God. And so here we are. You know, we've spent a lot of money. We've spent a lot of time. We've invested a lot of time and energy emotionally. And, you know, we're, we've already looked at this as our son. You know, we've held him. And it's like, welcome, you know. But, of course, that's where the awkwardness of an adoption is like, well, she, you know, birth mom is sitting there and she wants to hold her baby. And it's like, you can't deny that. And so she started to change her mind. And we had this, like, heart-to-heart discussion with her. And she, we couldn't budge her. And then we had a heart-to-heart discussion with the, the father. And he was adamant that this was happening and so he went and talked to the mom and and um and she you know she finally acknowledged that it was the right thing to do for them at the time and, and uh, let him go wow but it was the intense moment so how old is your son now uh he just turned 16 oh wow okay 16. yeah very this cool a while ago you know it's burned in my mind because it's such a cool thing just got his driver's permit that's scary (laughs) (laughs) tell me about it (laughs) mark i just want to be the first one to thank you so much um i mean i could spend hours on each of these topics so i appreciate the time and where should we point people towards where should they check out uh online well, feelfit.com is a wickedly cool website. A ton, my, I write a weekly blog. We have tons and tons of videos. Um, feelfit, S-E-A-L-F-I-T.com, all in word. Um, that's a cool place to go. And our YouTube channel is a lot of fun to check out. We've got tons of videos of Kokoro Camp and you know, the other training we do. Um, if you're interested in my mental training program, that's called Unbeatable Mind. So yeah. there's information on unbeatablemind.com. And my books are available at Amazon and you know, places that you buy books. And Audible. Yeah. And, right. Yeah. Check out Seal Fit, NavySeals.com even, and uh, Audible, Unbeatable Mind. Mark, thank you so much, Commander. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeremy. It's a pleasure, and uh, I appreciate it too. And next so, time I'm there, we'll do it in, a, in an ice water bath. <laughs> that sounds fun. <laughs> I'll hold you to that. That's fine. I'll, I'll have to train for it.